Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. If you would, I'd like for you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order in the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him, who is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised Him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to His cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, He made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day, or of the new moon, or of Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all of the body by joints and bands having nourishment, ministered, and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and the doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom in will, worship, and humility, and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, again we stand in Your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, asking that that He would be the teacher, that He would filter out that which is error, that which is foolishness, but open our hearts to that which is truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Galatians in our last study together. We had almost reached the end of chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. The Holy Spirit has Paul rehearsed to the Galatian believers his credentials for being 
an apostle and the fact that he had received a special revelation from the Lord that was the truth of the gospel that he proclaimed. He then also recounts the fact that he was urged by the believers at Antioch and impelled uh, or compelled by the Holy Spirit to go to Jerusalem and discuss uh, these things with the leaders of the church. And we've looked at that in chapter 2. The close of chapter 2, he points out that as an illustration of this, he withstood Peter to his face because Peter had separated from the Gentile believers for fear of the Jews. And then the Holy Spirit has Paul rehearse the fact that we are redeemed by the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's where we are in our present study. My conviction on that, for uh, whatever it's worth, is that you separate from brethren in Christ on moral grounds and you separate from fellowship with people on doctrinal grounds who are not brothers and sisters in Christ. 2 John, the epistle of John, not the gospel, but the epistle. 2 John 2, John uh, of John, verse 6. And this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world. And that, in fact, is the subject of our immediate study in Galatians. Many deceivers are entered into the system. The word world, cosmos, in the Greek, the, the ordered system. Who could, whoever confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. Now the subject, the question, is the word doctrine. So if you come to me and you tell me that, yeah, Steve, I believe Jesus Christ died on the cross, but if you're not water baptized, you can't go to heaven. That is doctrinal error, and I'm not going to support that kind of doctrine. In John's epistles, it's the testimony that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. I do not believe in any place and in the Word of God the expression, Jesus Christ came in the flesh or, or Jesus Christ was crucified is a simple, straightforward statement. Yes, God came in the flesh. But that's not what that statement means. The fact that Jesus Christ came in the flesh is that He came as your kinsman redeemer, that He as your kinsman redeemer paid the price in full, paid all of the price, so that nothing is left for you to pay. That's what the expression means when it says He came in the flesh. That's what the expression means when it says He was crucified. Christ was crucified. He died on the cross. But biblically, the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified indicates that He came as God Almighty to become man so that He could be crucified, that He was crucified in your place, and that He rose from the dead. The words used indicate that Jesus Christ became your kinsman redeemer, and as your kinsman redeemer, He paid the price by dying on the cross, and He rose from the dead to prove that it's paid. And it's based on that doctrine. Now, if you add to that some work in order to gain what he, you know, what he died to give you, 
or to do for you, then that is an area where it's very difficult to expect fellowship together in harmony in the doctrine. And I think that's very important. If you do not believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, then you're left with no other course but to redeem yourself. Jumping ahead here a bit, Galatians 4, But ye brethren, as Isaac was, are all the children of promise. But as then, so it is now, they which are born after the flesh persecute those who are born after the Spirit. But what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, we're not there yet in our study. That's a, that's a tremendous passage of Scripture, and we'll look at that in, in detail as, when we get there. And it's one of the great concerns to me. Does that passage of Scripture say that everybody that teaches works will be cast out? And that's the problem with not recognizing Christ in the flesh. It's a matter of works and, and, in, and not of what Christ has done. I believe that the Word teaches that God is sovereign. He really elects that you're set apart from your mother's womb. You're redeemed by God alone, Christ alone, and that you're not justified by your faith, but you're justified because... And we dealt with this. God is faithful. The Reformers, as I understand it, they believe exactly what I believe, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, died in your place, and only in your place, only for the elect. They believe that Jesus Christ died for the elect and, and He redeemed them, and that you are saved, that is delivered by your personal faith in Christ. And that's what I believe. That's what I believe. Now, I'm not sure that they believe or they all believe that you are made righteous by your personal faith in Christ. I've, I've, I've never read a Reformer that says that, and I don't either. You're made righteous because Jesus Christ died in your place. And one, once you're made righteous, you can accept Him. But you cannot accept Him unless you're made righteous. It is the new creation in you, folks, that accepts Christ, not your old man, your old creation. I do not believe justification and salvation are synonyms. I've tried to explain this in many a video. I don't want anybody here to live by my convictions. You have to search these things out for, for yourself. You know, here's this person believes that you ought to be water baptized to be in fellowship with the Lord. Well, that's one thing. Okay? To be water baptized in order to be redeemed is a totally, totally different thing. To be circumcised because you think the Lord wants you to be is one thing. To be circumcised in order to gain heaven is a totally different thing. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make a distinction between conviction and doctrine. Any number of people have come to me and said, you know, I want to be water baptized. You know, well, why? Why do you want to be water baptized? Well, because I think you need to be water baptized to be redeemed. And folks, I wouldn't have anything to do with that. I wouldn't touch it. If you can honestly say, well, I, I don't think it makes any difference, but I believe the Lord wants me to be water baptized, that's one thing. It's a totally different thing to make it a, a, a qualification for, for heaven. You know, for it to, we're not working in any way for our redemption, but I have no argument with anybody who wants to please the Lord. No argument at all. Now, if He wants to, to please Him ignorantly, I, I don't see why we should spend a lot of time supporting ignorance, but... Nevertheless, Paul, Paul could have said to Peter, you know, Peter, uh, that's, you know, you know that's, that's not very nice what you're doing. You know, the problem is Peter's motive was totally wrong. It was fear of the Jews. It wasn't pleasing God. 
Peter was not separating from the Gentiles in order to please God. The testimony of Scripture is very clear that he separated because of fear of the Jews. Fear of the Jews. I, I never have any problem with separation I, because when I state my position, well, they separate from me. I don't have to separate from them. I'd like to finish the second chapter this morning and, and there is what I think a great difference between personal conviction and biblical doctrine. Sound biblical doctrine. O Timothy, take heed unto doctrine for in so doing thou shalt both deliver thyself and them that hear thee. And that's what's not being done in many places today. There's a little emphasis on doctrine because, well, there seems to be the conviction that doctrine is what divides us and separates us when it's the truth is the Word states that doctrine is meant to divide. The 20th verse, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live, I, but I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I live in that sphere. It's, it's a... It's a dative. I live in the sphere of the faithfulness of the Son of God. I do not live in the sphere of my faithfulness, but I live in the sphere of the, in the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. That expression is Christ crucified. That expression is Christ come in the flesh. It's just a, another way of expressing the same truth. Who loved me, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Now the last verse, I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I absolutely do not frustrate. The word frustrate is a, a Greek word that means, well, it means to frustrate, but it also means to make null, to nullify, to disregard. I think the best translation here is I do not nullify or make of no effect the grace of God. Now, the grace of God, that's another genitive. It's God's grace. Nobody would translate that grace in God. It's the grace of God. God's grace. For if righteousness come through the law or by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. That's what it says. Now, we know that's not true. If you're going to say that righteousness comes by the law, then what you've done is reduce the death of Christ to a big fat nothing. That's what people don't seem to see. What the Judaizers were, were saying is not that Christ shouldn't have died. They weren't saying that, that Christ died for nothing or, or died in vain. They weren't saying that at all. They were, they were saying He died. But they were, they were saying that you have to add to it and over and over again, I've tried to point out to you folks that biblically, if you put the mathematical relationship on the blackboard, eternal life equals the death of Jesus Christ in your place plus, and the minute you put any plus in there, you've made the death of Jesus Christ nothing. You haven't reduced it. You've eliminated it. If your eternal life depends on anything at all that you do, then what Christ did doesn't make any difference. If in, if in any way righteousness could come by works of the law, then Christ is dead in vain. He died for no reason. Now that's a tremendous thought. That in any way where we attempt to gain redemption, what we have done is destroy the death of Christ. We had a, a verse just a few verses ago. I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. That's, that's what the legalist never seems to see. If, for example, in, in order to go to heaven, you must never ever run a parking meter beyond its limit, then, well, what's my concern going to be? Well, let me tell you, if that were true, my concern is going to be that parking meter or any other law that you can name. I'm going to live to that law, not to God. I don't, I don't know how to put it in, in 
in words. What it ought to do to your heart, regardless of how much sin in your life, what that really ought to do to your heart, regardless of, of the old man that you... I'm not trying to minimize sin. If you don't think sin is, is bad, God did because it cost Him the life of His Son, but you stand before God without fault, with no condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. By the blood of His cross, He presented you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. The only response of the heart can be praise. How wonderful He is. How marvelous is grace. So I live unto God, but the minute you put law keeping in there, you've, you've fallen from grace. As a young person, I was told that you know you at least have to go to church on Sunday morning to go to heaven. You know what so what then was my concern? Well, to make certain that I was in church on Sunday morning, so I'd go to heaven. It, it wasn't living unto God. It was living unto church on Sunday morning, so I'd go to heaven. And that would be true of any regulation, any regulation put on you. If you're living unto God, the only reason is love because you love Him. If you're concerned about why He loves you, well, you, then what you're saying basically is, is that, well, you ought to be lovable and you're not. Sorry to burst your bubble, but, you know, you're not. God does not love you because you're lovable. God does not love you because you're different. God does not love you because you're better than everybody else or better than somebody else or, or stranger than anybody else in the world. He loves you because you're His. He knew you from the foundation of the world. He chose you unto Himself. He died in your place. He totally redeems you. You, could, you couldn't unredeem yourself if you spent your life trying. Go ahead. Try Try it. it. It doesn't work. When we realize we're alive unto God because He died for us, then we live unto God. We set our affections, we set all of our affections on things above, not on things below, not on things on the earth. If you're dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world system, why as though living in it are you subject to its, to its ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. You've risen with Christ. So set your affection on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God because His work is finished. That's why He's seated at the right hand of God. What a difference in our daily walk when we realize that we are one with Christ, that we belong to Him, that we were held in the hollow of His hand. We could not crawl out if we tried. And nobody could drag us. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other cre creation, that includes us, shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He gave Himself up for me. I give myself up for Him. It, 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 was, it was not His works, but the Father's through Him. It is not my works, but His works through me. His peace be unto you, dearly beloved. Until next time, rest in Him. Thanks for watching.